Welcome to Conundrums, the netcast that explores the mysteries of our universe. Today we have Dennis Balthaser. He is a UFO uh, researcher. He's a Roswell expert. He's an expert on Area 51 and the Pyramids of Giza. We're going to be talking to Dennis next on Conundrums. Dennis is an independent Roswell researcher. He's done a lot of research on Area 51. He's looked into uh, the uh, Giza pyramids, and he is our guest tonight. How you doing, Dennis? I'm doing good. You did good with the name. <laughs> you know, you notice I'm not using your last name again because I don't want to mispronounce it. It's Balthaser. That's good. Well, I want to talk with you a little bit about your background in ufology. How did you get started in all this, Dennis? Well, my background is civil engineering. I had uh, three years in the United States Army back, way back in 1959 to 62. I was in an engineering battalion down at Fort Bliss, Texas, and uh, they assigned me to Greenland twice, and I never forgave the Army for that. And then uh, got out of the Army, and immediately I went to work for the Texas Highway Department. I had 33 years of civil engineering with with uh, Texas doing quality assurance and quality control of materials that we use for constructing highways. And I traveled to 34 states, to Korea and South Africa three times to inspect materials that we were using to build bridges and, and highways. So I had 33 years, 36 years in all of uh, civil engineering background. The UFO stuff started uh, probably 20, 25 years ago as a hobby. Mm -hmm. uh, lay in the backyard and look out at the night sky and wonder what was out there. Bought a book, and next day I bought another book and started buying books, and now I have well over a hundred in my library. And was just fascinated with the possibility of what might be out there that we don't know about. Have you ever I seen was, one yourself? Have you ever seen a UFO? Uh, no, I haven't. And, and a lot of people are surprised, but I've never been to Australia, and they tell me it's there, so I, I don't think it's... <laughs> really necessary that you have to see them. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Your civil engineering background, that put you in a really good position to understand how they built the pyramids. I wanted to talk with you a little bit about your research into the Giza pyramids. What? Who do you think built the pyramids? I have no idea, really, but I, mm -hmm. I can pretty well assure you that the three pyramids of Giza and the Sphinx were more than likely not built by the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. I think we have pretty good proof that, well, I know we do on the Sphinx. The, the Sphinx is deteriorated by by water on the back of it, and consequently the, the Sphinx was covered up to its neck in sand until the 1800s. They didn't even know there was a body there, and they uncovered it, and there was a body of a lion. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't that type moisture rainfall in that part of the world for at least 10,000, maybe 15,000 years. So that automatically would predate the Egyptian civilization. Right. One of the researchers that I work with has done a lot of research on the pyramids, and he has come up with the civilization known as Kemetians, K-H-E-M-I-I-A-N. Mm -hmm. It was a black civilization that lived in North Africa about 10 or 12,000 years ago. And he claims that they think that they had contact with star people. Ah, okay. Well, I'm not going to say that ETs built the pyramids, but I am leaning towards the possibility that the technology to build them could have come from the star people. Uh, there's no record anywhere in Egypt on how the pyramids of Giza were built. Mm -hmm. There's probably 80 or 90 other pyramids, at least, in Egypt. And... They were probably built by the Egyptians, but if you look at them, they're all poor replicas of the three of Giza. Right. And, you know, people have argued, or, well, scientists say that this, the pyramids were built by using ramps or using a lot of people and a lot of manpower to do it. Why is that not possible based on what you've researched on the pyramids? 
Well, the, the Great Pyramid contains two and a half million stones. They weigh anywhere from two to 70 tons each. Mm -hmm. Those stones were quarried miles away from where the pyramids are. So if you look at the time it took to quarry them, to cut them, to load them on a barge, bring them up the Nile River, transport them across to where the pyramids are, you would have had to set a, a stone about every 90 seconds. They claim there was 20 to 30,000 people that worked 20 or 30 years. If mm -hmm. you do the math, it doesn't come out. They would have had to set a stone every 90 seconds, which is an impossibility. Yeah, and uh, the, just the transportation of the stones and then moving them, that would have been you know, practically impossible. Even with our technology today, can we duplicate the pyramids? No, we can't. Uh, I've done uh, some pretty big jobs with the Texas Highway Department on bridge construction, and we had one bridge that we were within two feet of and when we got to the center of the span on a 1200 foot span, which wasn't bad engineering. We cut a piece, set it in place, and the bridge was complete. The pyramids are off a quarter inch on each side. Some of the stones are cut to within a 50th of an inch. You can't get a piece of paper between them. So they talk about using ramps to get these stones to the top. The, the big pyramid is 440 feet tall. I can't imagine how long a ramp they would have to have to get those stones up there. The other possibility was a spiral type ramp, which went around the four sides. But again, if you're going to do that in the time period that the Egyptologists tell us, it's not going to happen. It's not possible. I think uh, Nova on the public television a couple of years ago tried to duplicate building the pyramids, and they wound up using heavy equipment and still couldn't do it. But there are no records that we're aware of of who built them, why they were built, or when they were built. Exactly. And to build the ramp would be a project equal to building the pyramids, just to put the thing together, right? It would have to be, I haven't done the calculations on it, but it, the length of it would have to be tremendous. And one of the theories I'm looking at now is the possibility that the bottom stones, maybe halfway or two-thirds of the way up the pyramid, were probably quarried and then brought over on the Nile to, to their location. Mm -hmm. But it appears that those that are up high may have been cast in place. They may have been formed. If you look at the tops of those stones, most of them are pretty flat, mm -hmm. which means that they may have been finished off like we do concrete today. And that would have been a possibility and would have taken less people to do than to use a ramp. So how, how would... Well, I guess my question would be, would they have had the technology to to create something like concrete that would be as strong as it is and still remain today? That, that's a good point, uh, Jay. But if you're looking at the pyramids, with that much weight, you'd think over that period of time they would have begun to, to go into the, to the sand. There had to be something underneath them to support them. Mm -hmm. uh, the theories is that maybe there's a mountain range below ground there or, or some type sub base that is tremendously hard because that weight would have sunk into the to the sand over a period of time. And that's not happened. Right. So do we know what's under the pyramids? We do not. But we do know that if you take all the land mass of the earth, the dead center of all the land mass is exactly where the pyramids are located. And another interesting thing is their alignment. If you look at the pyramids from above, airplane, wherever, they are aligned exactly like the stars in Orion's belt in the constellation Orion. Two of them are lined up. The third one is just slightly offset. And if you look at the night sky at Orion's constellation, at Orion's belt, it's exactly the same. Now, this, this race of people, uh, the and let me see if I'm pronouncing this, the Comechis, Comechians? Comechians. Uh, tell me a little more about them and how they could be related to have, having created this. Well, Stephen Mueller is one of our researchers on the, on the advisory board of the Pyramid Association I belong to. And he met a gentleman in Egypt who has had all this documentation and all this stuff in his head for years. Mm-hmm. He has passed that on to his daughter, and uh, Stephen has 
spent hours and hours and hours with this man talking about this Phoenician civilization. And they have found out that they lived in North Africa. They were a black civilization, mm-hmm. predominantly controlled by females, and supposedly had this contact with star people. If you look at the tools that the Egyptians had, again, you have a problem building these pyramids with the tools that were available. Right. And what kind of tools did they have, and what would they have needed to have built the pyramids? Well, they had copper tools mostly, and uh, there's been there's been research done on on the possibility of uh, being able to cut these stones using the tools they had. Mm-hmm. But the problem I have is the time factor. If you're talking twenty or thirty years with twenty or thirty thousand people to do it, then it's an impossible task. You can't do two and a half million stones in that period of time. Exactly. And um, have you? Do you know anything new that has uh, come out about the uh, the pyramids? Any any new information about them recently? Well, one of the things that we found was that the Great Pyramid of the three, the Great Pyramid was supposedly built for Khufu, who was a pharaoh of the fourth dynasty. Mm-hmm. We have never found anything inside the pyramid. The Arabs were the first to go in the pyramids in 890 A.D., and the only thing they found in there was an empty coffer, an empty box. No right. lid, no hieroglyphics, no material for the afterlife, which all the pharaohs had in their tombs. And they found a statue of Khufu, which is three inches tall, miles away from the pyramids, which is now in the, in the Cairo Museum. So if this was built for Khufu, as they say, he didn't have anything for the afterlife. So and how did like, they? How did Khufu get associated with the pyramids? That that he is. Well, according to the Egyptologists, they're the ones that say that it was built for Khufu. I have, I have nothing to verify that that's that's true. And mm-hmm. pictures and nothing was found in the pyramids uh, when the Arabs went, first went in there in 890 AD. You know, it doesn't make sense that that they would bury a pharaoh in there if they don't give him anything for the afterlife, because that's what it was all about. Right. Secondly, the, the Great Pyramid is the only pyramid that has both vertical and decreasing air shafts. Dead pharaohs don't need air, so, you know, what were those for? Right. Uh, we, we looked at the Sphinx. There is a void in one of the paws of the Sphinx, and we think maybe there might be some information in there about how the pyramids were built. But thus far, we've not been able to get in there. The Egyptians won't let anybody go into that paw. And I think maybe if you look at this from a tourism standpoint, I'm sitting here telling you that the three pyramids of Giza weren't built by the Egyptians. That's not going to sell well in Egypt because the tourism is big business. What do you think the purpose of the pyramids was for? Well, Joe Parr, another researcher, believes that it was an energy machine of some sort. He spent two nights on top of the Great Pyramid with some equipment. He discovered a a bubble type around the pyramid, and he thinks that uh, the energy source probably coincides with the 11-year sunspot cycle. But uh, we're pretty well convinced that it may have been an energy machine of some kind. Now, another interesting thing with the pyramids is they were covered. What you see today is not what was original. They were all covered with polished limestone. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the pyramids, uh, the second one in the in the row of three, is the son of Khufu. And at the top of that one, you can still see some of the polished limestone, and those were supposedly visible from the moon when you, when the sun reflects off of them, you can see it from the moon. Mm-hmm. Is there a connection there with something from out there? We don't know. And the alignment with uh, with the star systems. Um, if it were built by Egyptians, why would they do that? The Egyptians had a lot of knowledge about astronomy, and uh, we found other things over the years that uh, that indicate that they did have. And uh, you know, Stonehenge is another one that maybe had some connection with uh, with astronomy. Uh, the Native Americans uh, they talk about the Seven Sisters. The star system, seven sisters. So you know, some of these older civilizations had a lot of knowledge about our stars that 
we don't have today. And do you believe that that knowledge came from an extraterrestrial connection? Ooh. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that's a good question, huh? That's that's the $64,000 question. I don't want to commit to it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I won't rule it out, mm. but uh, I, don't, I can't sit here and say yes as a matter of fact, but uh, that thing with the Comedian civilization is interesting. If they, in fact, had contact with star people, like I said earlier, then I'm not saying ETs build them, but the technology could have well come from there. Yeah. Very well could have. All right, let's talk about Roswell a little bit. When did you get involved with uh, investigating the Roswell incident? Well, that was the first research I ever done. Uh, I had heard about Roswell back about 1980, 1982. Mm -hmm. You know, Roswell happened in 1947. And three days after it happened, that was the end of the story. General Ramey came out with a, a headline saying that it was nothing but a weather balloon. Right. And uh, that was after the, the military had said they had in their possession a fine shelter. So we've had four excuses over the last 63 years, and I'm sure if I live long enough, we'll have another one. But uh, I became interested in it when Stanton Friedman, who was the original Roswell researcher, and I believe you had him on your show not long ago. Yes, we did. The group physicist, and he found Jesse Marcel, Major Marcel in Louisiana, interviewed him, and the research began again. And then I started reading books, watching videos, and doing whatever I could to get information about Roswell. When I retired in 1996, I decided to move up here. I became involved with the UFO Museum for about two and a half years, and then began doing the, the research on my own as an independent researcher. Mm -hmm. And I continued to do that for the last 12 years. Now, on May 27th, 1997, you got a really strange phone call, didn't you? <laughs> You've been doing some research. <laughs> I, I want you to tell us about that phone call, because that's fascinating. Uh, it was a strange phone call. I got a call from Oklahoma mm -hmm. from a gentleman who said his daddy had been stationed here as a military policeman and had a piece of the metal. Mm -hmm. Now, this is and metal I from Roswell, metal they picked up off the ground. He was an MP and had been out at the crash site, picked up a piece of metal he found, stuck in his pocket, and all those years later he still had it and had called his son into a rest home where he was being, he was recovering from cancer mm -hmm. and uh, six months to live. The son contacted us because they were afraid to have it. The old man had told them that people would kill over that. Mm -hmm. And I went over to Oklahoma to meet him. Got a motel room, called the number we had, and couldn't make any contact. And then finally, about 3.30 in the afternoon, my phone rang, and a woman said, meet him at Denny's Restaurant at 7 o'clock. So I went to Denny's Restaurant, a man and woman came in, he said, are you I said, I am. I said, who are you? He said, well, he said, we're special agents of the United States Air Force Office of Special Investigation. He said, gentlemen, you plan on meeting will not be at this meeting. I said, how'd you know I was coming over here? Is my phone tapped? He smiled and he said, you know how we do business. He said, we knew Monday you'd be here Friday. Uh -huh. I spent three and a half hours with him. We talked about UFOs. We talked about Area 51. We talked about the Bible. We, we covered the whole spectrum. Did they confirm then, anything about UFOs being OSI agents? Um, he had a lot of information. He had a map of New Mexico. We talked about the crash sites. He had some drawings of UFOs. We talked about different shaped UFOs. So he had done some homework. Mm -hmm. And three and a half hours of meeting was a lot of lot of meeting. And I didn't take any notes during the meeting because I was very uncomfortable. And this went on for, I guess, six months, eight months. And I finally decided to go public with it three months after I returned from Oklahoma. Because I was paranoid. I didn't know what would happen when I turned ignition on my truck or when I got into my residence, what I'd find. And uh, we kept after this. And 12 years later, two years ago, with the help of Frank Warren, a researcher from California, we found out that I was, I was scammed. It was a hoax. Ah, so we, these guys were not from Langley. We got a hold of a guy's ex-wife who happened to be the female agent I met with. 
and she said her husband had done, her ex-husband had done this before. I guess it was his way of having kicks. But had I <clears throat> had I been able to do this and, and clarify it earlier, I would have filed a lawsuit against them for impersonating federal agents. Right. But the statute, statute of limitations ran out, so I couldn't. But to me, it's good research. Twelve years of research to put an end to it. Well, exactly, uh, yeah. I mean, so maybe you have to re- you have to reveal the hoaxes as well as you know the the original information or good information that you get. Hoaxes yeah, right. they cause us a lot of problems, and it and it, it, it wastes time for researchers. So but I'm proud learning. that you were able to to break it and and understand that it was a hoax. It was a learning experience for me. If I ever have the opportunity again, I will either have someone else with me, mm-hmm. or I'll be protected in some way because. For, for a few months there, it changed my life. Uh, when I went public with it, Stanton Friedman was the one that told me, go public. He said, because if something happens, we need to know what you went through. Right. And it was it was well done. There were probably five or six people involved. And, you know, for a, for a hoax, usually that's a big splash to embarrass you, and that's it. Right. It was pretty much harsh, and the guys knew what they were doing, but uh, it had my attention, I can assure you. Were they wearing Air Force uniforms? No, he was. They were in civilian clothes, very neat. Uh, in fact, I checked his shoes; they were polished. You know, you look for the military things. Mm-hmm. Military he haircut. Had, no, he had long hair, which which bothered me a little bit. But then I thought maybe he was blending in with the, uh, you know, society and, and didn't want to be conspicuous. So that I didn't pay much attention to that. Mm-hmm. Now, during your research with. Um uh, on Roswell, uh, can you tell me the uh, Jim Ragsdale story? I don't put any confidence in the Jim Ragsdale story. Uh, that was made popular by the UFO Museum. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he had two affidavits of where he was and what he saw, and uh, I just don't put any confidence in that site. We have at least three different sites that have talked about. The Corona debris site, the Corn Rain site, and the Jim Ragsdale site. And the only one I put any confidence in is the Corona debris field where rancher Mac, uh, Mac Brazel, the foreman of the Foster Ranch, found the material, had had recovered balloons before because there was a reward for them. Mm-hmm. So he knew what the balloons were. And that's the only one I put any confidence in is, is that site there. The Ragsdale story... Made some money for the museum with the the book and the video and things like that, but I'd have to have a lot more verification to believe the Jim Wrightsville story. Okay, Dennis, you've done a lot of uh, research on Area 51 as well. Do you have any new information on that area and that base? I can assure you that it hasn't been shut down or moved like the rumors are floating around. I was up there a few years ago. I did couple of lectures at Rachel, the little town next to the base, and we drove out to both of the, the gates, there's the front and back gates, and the, the one that most people are, are familiar with is the one that goes down a 13-mile long dirt road, and I told my wife when we were driving down that dirt road, I said, watch for a pickup or a jeep up on a hill here when we come around corners, and sure enough, we went about 10 miles and come around the corner, and there were the guards sitting up in a pickup truck with binoculars watching us and listening to what we were saying. And uh, they also went back to the back gate, which has two drop-down gates on it, has a camera mounted on about a 30-foot high pole, and I walked down along the boundary, and that old camera would just follow me, and every time I'd stop, the camera would come down on me, and I found out I waved at the guards because it's got to be a boring job for them to sit out there in the middle of the desert. As yeah. far as we know, there from people that have worked there, supposedly there are 22 levels below ground. And Area 51 today is the size of Connecticut. It is gigantic. And as far as what goes on there, we don't really know. We do know that the President of the United States exempts them from environmental laws because uh, they burn toxic waste above ground. No one else in the country is allowed to do that. The two presidential determinations started with Clinton, followed up by George W. Bush. Interestingly, I've not been able to find one with Obama. 
So I don't know if he is not going forward with the, the exemption or if they just don't make it public. But uh, I have not been able to find it yet that Obama is president. It wouldn't surprise me if he dropped it. But uh, it all came about because two men died of radiation exposure a couple of years ago. Their wives sued the government. The judge told them you can't sue something that doesn't exist, mm -hmm. meaning the base isn't there. And for years, they didn't admit that the base existed. We found out about Area 51 through a Russian satellite system. Right. It, was open, it was open in 1955 by the CIA to test the U-2 aircraft. They looked at 12 locations in the southwest and decided on Groom Lake and went in there and brought the U-2 in. And every airplane that we have since then has been test flown there. The A-10, the A-12, the B-1, the B-2, the Stealth, all of them. There's a couple of new ones being tested there now, the Aurora, the Black Manta, the Pumpkin Seed. And we believe that the Aurora is probably a pulsating propulsion system because it has a, a, a contrail that looks like donuts on a roof. It's a straight contrail with circles every so often. So it's an interesting place, and to me it's a catch-22 situation. If, in fact, aliens or and or UFOs were kept there, like the rumors we hear, I'd like to know that. Right. But we, we do need a place to do our technology, to develop new aircraft and things like that, so our adversaries don't know about it. Uh, do you believe the Bob Lazar story about S-4? I have trouble with Bob Lazar's story because of uh, his background. For one thing, he claims to have uh, degrees from MIT and Caltech, I believe. Hmm. He's never been able to verify any of that. His uh, personal life has been kind of shaky. And uh, I talked to a physicist one time that he said that the physics he talks about the uh, doesn't go far enough on, on back engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob is one of them guys I'd like to believe, but right now I don't have the, the confirmation. The same with uh, Colonel Corso, the book The Day After Roswell. It's got a lot of information in that book, and it's a page turner. You pick it up and you start reading, you don't stop. But what bothers me is there are no references in the back of the book. So it's all hearsay. This type of research, you cannot... You can't go out on a limb with it. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to verify information. And I think my engineering background helps me on that because I don't try to convince anyone of the ET situation. I will share my research and let the audience decide what they want to believe. But I am of the firm belief that we have been, we are and have been visited by extraterrestrials for many, many years, long, much longer than the Russell incident. Do you think that there are aliens at Area 51? That's been reported, but uh, again, there's no confirmation. It, it's extremely hard to get information from anyone that has been there. When you go to work at Area 51, you sign papers saying that you will not talk to anyone, including your family. So, you know, you're limited to what you can say. And there's been a few people that have leaked information some of it has been verified, some of it has not. And like most of this type of research, you know, you have to have that verification. How did you find out that there were 23 levels below the base? From one of the gentlemen that worked there, he claimed that there were 23 levels there, and there's a place called S4, which is south of the, the main base, uh, Papoose Lake. That was, that's where Bob Lazar supposedly went, and there was supposed to be seven levels below ground there. There are a couple of bases out in, the, in California that have up to 34 levels below ground. White Sands Missile Range, which is about 100 miles south of here. I know of a fourth level because they did some laser testing there. We believe there's seven levels there also. And this, this underground stuff is, uh, is something that had to happen because of satellites. When you can read a newspaper from 200 miles up, you can no longer do any secretive work above ground. So it either has to be done below ground or in a hangar or a building of some kind. And that's the reason that we do that. And most other countries also. And do you, uh, do you think that there may be um, engineering or back engineering alien technology in these bases? Well, if you look at the technology we've had over the last 50 to 100 years, 
it's really mushroom. And did we have the help of some of that? Perhaps. Uh, Phil Corso, Lieutenant Colonel Corso, claimed that microchips and lasers came from the Roswell craft. Night vision. Well, we were working on night vision before he made that statement because we had captured German night vision. If you remember the old red night vision, night, then we went to the green, which they use today. The uh, microchips were invented at the Texas Instruments. The guy got a Nobel Peace Prize for it. So I have questions on whether or not that technology came from ETs or not. The possibility exists that some of it could have. And my theory is if they can get here from wherever they're from, they have technology and knowledge that we can't comprehend. Maybe there is no such thing as illness or sickness, and uh, maybe they have cures for those things. Or maybe they've been through what we're going through, and, and they're here to, to advise us, you know, to straighten up. Uh, we're, we're pretty much war people. Uh, right. The human... The human race is the only species on the planet that can't get along with each other. And because of religions, because of boundaries and, and the color of skin and things like that. So, you know, we have nothing to offer. And if their technology is that, that they can get here, then there are thousands, tens of thousands of years ahead of us. And even if that technology didn't, you know, wasn't directly uh, Roswell technology wasn't directly involved in uh, what we developed. It may have inspired it. Uh, it's yeah. possible that someone could have been shown it and said, okay, now you go and you see if you can duplicate this. And they didn't have to have the actual technology to do it. They just needed to see that it worked. And then they can say, oh, well, now that I know it works, I'll go build one. Do you think that's if possible? If I, can, if I can go back to Roswell, sure. my theory of Roswell, and this is my theory, but Whatever was recovered 63 years ago, I don't believe they still know what they have. Right. The debris was small pieces. The Aztec crash up in northern New Mexico in 1948, that was a crash 99 feet in diameter, pretty much intact. But as far as possible, I think they're still trying to figure out what they have. The, the propulsion system, the guidance system, where they were from, their motive for being here, and until our military gets the advantage out of that technology, I don't look for them to go public or admit to anything ever happening. Because that would be a tremendous advantage to the military to have a, a craft that could do what these crafts supposedly do. And do you think our, our government has had direct uh, communication involvement with ETs? The reports I've seen with Eisenhower where he had two separate meetings with ETs. Mm -hmm. One down here at Holloman Air Force Base at Almagorda, 100 miles south of here, and another one at Edwards Air Force Base. He went out to Palm Dale or Palm Springs, California, while he's president, and was out of contact for a while. And the news media said he had a dental appointment. Well, the reports we're getting are that he had met with aliens. Hmm. If he did, in fact, do that, then he broke law because you can't have any type of diplomatic relationship with a foreign country or foreigners without congressional approval. And he would have done that on his own. Now, one of the things that surprises people about our presidents, and I'm talking all presidents, is that they don't have knowledge about this information. They may have been informed that it exists, but they do not have the security clearance to have all the information. Most presidents since Truman have tried to open up the UFO file and failed miserably. A couple of them, Reagan had a sighting while he was governor. In fact, his, he told his pilot to try to follow it, and they saw one one night. Jimmy Carter made a report to the Mutual UFO Network when he was governor and, and said that he had seen a UFO. Clinton was interested in UFOs. He had a couple of books in his library at the White House. He told his assistant, Hubble, to go out and find out about the, the Kennedy assassination and about the Roswell incident, and Hubble came back and said, I can't find a thing. George Bush Sr. would, to me, be the one man 
who has been president but might have had more knowledge than the others because he was head of the CIA before he became president. Right. Reagan went public at the United Nations on videotape and said that maybe we need something coming from out there to bring us all together here. Mm -hmm. And he was told, don't ever go public with that again. Do you think Obama the, has any information at all on whether or not ETs exist? Obama? Obama? Do you think he would know anything? Or he, again, would not have the clearance to know? Uh, I think the presidents are briefed. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, this is a need-to-know thing, and, and it's got a higher security clearance than the, than the bombs do, the atomic bomb and hydrogen bomb. And, you know, people wonder how can they keep secrets. Well, the atomic bomb had 50,000 people involved for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. The code in the Second World War was kept quiet for some 20 years. Area 51 existed since 1955, and we found out about it through the satellite picture from the Russians. So they're good at keeping secrets. They can do that. And Roswell, you know, it's often been said that, well, the government couldn't keep a secret that big. Do you think they can? I think they've done it for 63 years. They've given us four excuses. Mm -hmm. uh, July 8, 1947, Walter Hawk was the public relations officer out of the base and under orders of Colonel Blanchard, the base commander. He wrote an article that was distributed in all papers west of Chicago, afternoon edition, July 8, saying we have in our possession a flying saucer. And you know, some critics have said, well, he just, he released that without any authorization. He just put that out there. Is that possible at a military base to put out? Uh, when you consider that Colonel Blanchard went on to become a four-star general at the Pentagon, considered for Joint Chief of Staff, he was the second highest military man in, in, in the military at the time. I think he probably had told somebody that that was going out. In fact, he may have got word down from Washington to put that report out because General Ramey was ready to cover it up the next day. Less than 14 hours later, Ramey said that the guys of the 509th, and you have to understand, the 509th was an elite group. They dropped the atomic bombs of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Second World War. So these were not just typical GIs. These were the best we had. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to believe they were too dumb to know the difference between a flying saucer and a weather balloon. Exactly. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. So you have investigated Area 51, and tell me about some of these other underground bases you mentioned earlier. There's uh, the 23 levels under Area 51. You mentioned uh, Salt Lake. Is there? Uh, no, there, there was one White Sands, White Sands. Uh, underground, and a couple of them out in uh, California. We think that most of the military bases, at least in the western United States, are probably interconnected with tunnels and maybe levitation devices that run back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, Los Alamos, the National Lab, uh, White Sands, Area 51, Edwards Air Force Base, so various places I'm sure are all interconnected. But one of the things that I found about these underground facilities is who's in charge of them. Many are controlled by FEMA. Ah. The federal is a management agency. They set these up as a continuity of government years ago to protect our leaders in the event of a national emergency mm -hmm. or a nuclear attack. So you and I, Jay, are in big trouble because if something happens, we're still above ground. Right. Our leaders go below ground, and you and I are paying for that. But FEMA has over 100 underground facilities. And they have databases on nearly all Americans. They probably know more about you than your mother knows. And this is uncomfortable for me. FEMA is there when you need them for emergencies, but they're also heavily involved. Just like the CIA, their budget, you don't know what their budget is. Right. But there are locations around Washington for the president, for the Congress. Raven Rock, Pennsylvania is an underground Pentagon, where in the event of national emergency, our leaders would be taken underground, as they were during the 9-11 terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. Cheney went underground at the White House. Uh, President Bush was on Air Force One. He stopped at Nebraska and went under base underground. 
at a sack base there before returning to Washington. So our leaders are well protected thanks to our tax money, but you and I, kiss a goodbye. Exactly. And you think these bases are connected together through underground tunnels? Yeah, I think most of them are. Uh, some of the equipment that's being used is just unbelievable. Some of these tunnel boring machines. And my interest in underground bases stems from my background with civil engineering. Mm -hmm. And some of these things are gigantic machines. They can bore a, a 30, 40, 50 foot diameter hole and can run through the ground depending on the material they're going through five feet an hour, you know, if they want to. Uh, the tunnel between France and England. They use five or six of these machines there. Uh, I have a picture of one that has the Air Force emblem on it, meaning the Pentagon owns at least one of them, and that was used at Skull Mountain and probably used at Area 51. There are several types. They have the flame cutter, which shoots flames into the, the, the face of the dirt and melts it, and they bring it out as a muck. Uh, there's one that's a, a chewable type thing that you just, you've seen them on TV where they chew up the dirt and they put it on the conveyor and then get it out. But the one that is amazing to me is the nuclear one, developed at Los Alamos in 1973 at the National Lab. It's a nuclear boring machine that as it goes through the earth, it melts the rock and dirt and pushes it into the wall of the hole it just made, causing a, a glass-like lining. Hmm. Nothing out of the ground, nothing has to go in the ground to support the, the tunnel. So they could be digging underneath us right now and we wouldn't know it. But this was in 1973. I have the patent number and I have a drawing of the nuclear device, but I wonder all these years later what they might have now. Exactly. And you know, there have been stories for years that these underground bases, that there are extraterrestrials that move from one to the other. Have you ever had anyone actually confirm that, that there are ETs living in the underground bases? Well, one of the places they talk about is Dulce, New Mexico, which is up in northern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And there again, we're talking about a seven or eight, nine level uh, structure underground in the Archuleta Mesa on the, the mountain up there. There's been talk that there's biogenetics taking place there between aliens and uh, Americans, and again, I have no confirmation on that, it's rumor, but uh, it's something we continue to look at. I was at Dulce two years ago, Norio Hayatawa was another researcher, and he set up a, a conference to, up at Dulce, the first one they've ever had, and that's the, the headquarters for the Hickory Apache Indian Reservation. Mm -hmm. They were not too happy with those white people being there. And they all stayed at the hotel. They have a Best Western Hickory Apache motel there. The meeting was supposed to start at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Well, about 6 o'clock Sunday morning, everybody in the hotel was woken up to the sound of a helicopter. We went outside and looked, and there was a black, unmarked helicopter hovering above the hotel. We think he was probably checking license plates on who was at the, the meeting. But the, the Hickory Apache were not happy about that that incident, that that helicopter showed up. But what I found out of Native Americans is that a lot of times, if they see something in the sky, they pretty much take it as a personal thing, and they don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. I did ask one Native American one time, I said, why don't you all talk about the, the UFOs and the stars and things like that, because you have so much knowledge. And his answer was, no one asked. Mm. Which I thought was a great answer. That's a great answer. And yeah, I and mean, we're now beginning to ask those questions. What are these things? Um, the area uh, of Roswell and uh, Area 51 and all out there, there's a lot of, uh, are there a lot of uh, still Native Americans in that area? There's, you know, New Mexico, for some reason, and this is something that just came up, not long ago, I'd never thought about, but most of the incidents that happen in New Mexico are in close proximity to, to Native Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, Roswell is not far, 70 miles from the Mescalera Apache over at Rio Dosa, up at, uh, at Aztec, which was a 1948 crash. You have uh, a Native American reservation up there. 
over Dulce, you have the Hickory Apache. So I'm wondering, and this is something I may want to look at, if there is some connection. Because one of the things mentioned was that if they were coming here from wherever they're from, would they not want to look for people who have close family ties, who have a lot of history, and who don't particularly like outsiders? And I think that's a good point that I, I may need to look into a little bit. And the Hopi Indians have had traditions going back to their beginning of people from yeah, the they, stars that brought them. They claim they came out of the earth near Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, you know, so is it ETs or is it underground or what is it? But the Native American have a lot of knowledge about the, the star system. They talk about the seven sisters and things like that. And I have two, I think I have two links on my website, truthseeker at roswell.com that, uh, or Native American, and I'm always looking for more because they have so much information. Um, I had read on your website something you wrote about a year ago, uh, and it seemed, I think it was February that you wrote it, it seemed you may have been talking about retiring. Or at least that was the sense I got from what you were you were writing. I think the article was, was entitled Up to This Point, or Right Now, and it just seemed like you were, in that article, you were acting like maybe you were going to retire. Are you planning to retire anytime soon? Oh, uh, I'll be 69 in October. And uh, this is the most frustrating thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, sending in freedom of information requests and getting a, a form letter with a stamp on it that said those records may have been destroyed in the fire of 1973. You know, that kind of thing, and constantly fighting with the government and, and the military. And don't take me wrong, I have the highest respect for our military. When I talk badmouth the military, I'm talking a few individuals in the military, not not our gut soldiers. I mean, I, I really appreciate what they, what they do and what they have done. Uh, but I think there's a few people, and I think this is probably controlled by very few people, civilian or military or and military, as for retiring, uh, it's in my blood. There's no doubt about it. And I keep hoping that in my lifetime we'll get a, a deathbed confession maybe on Roswell, which would open things up, or maybe we'll learn more about the underground systems or the pyramids, of course. But that, you know, that's the one thing that is physically there that we can see, right. uh, unlike the UFO stuff. But... I don't know, I talked about retiring next year, but then I got a, a email today from a, a group in Missouri that would like for me to come over there and speak to them next year. So I don't know if it's going to be possible. Well, My wife allows me to do this. I, I lose money doing it. I've got a wet master up in Albuquerque who's been with me, gosh, since I started in 99, I guess. And... Uh, she does amazing things on my website. I write things, and she puts artwork and pictures with it and, and has it all organized, and, and I'm real proud of, of the work she does for me. Well, I, for one, hope you never retire. I want you out there. <laughs> <laughs> we need guys like you out there. Let's talk about your books and your DVDs. Roswell, Then and Now, uh, you've got uh, some things for sale on your uh, website, Inter Underground Bases, uh, Area 51, Tell me uh, some about your lectures and your DVDs. I Basically, I do four areas of research. I do the 1947 Roswell incident, of course, Area 51, Underground Bases, and the Great Pyramids of Giza. And I do have uh, DVDs on uh, my website that can be ordered. I also have a booklet that I wrote which covers all four of my areas of research. And I decided years ago to limit myself on research because I found that if you get into this stuff, and you get into abductions and sightings and, and all this other stuff, crop circles, mutilations, pretty soon you're, you're just swamped and you don't really know anything. Mm -hmm. So I try to concentrate on these four areas only, and I have a big interest in the other things, but I don't do the research on them very often. But uh, go to my website, truthseekeratroswell.com. I've been writing editorials about every other month since 1999. I think there's about 62, 63 editorials there about my research. And uh, I get a lot of comments on the editorials. They're distributed every other month to about 31 websites and UFO magazines. And 
I enjoy doing radio, I enjoy doing editorials, and I particularly enjoy doing lectures and interviews because, like with your show here, you never know what's going to come up. And that keeps me sharp, and I, and I appreciate it when, when someone calls my hand on something because that, that makes it interesting and shows they're paying attention. Well, check out his book, Searching for the Truth. He's got uh, DVD lectures on uh, his website, and that's uh, The Truth Seeker. What, what is your uh, URL for your uh, website? Truthseeker at Roswell. That's the word at, A-T. Truthseeker at Roswell.com. And my email address, phone number, and all is on the website. So you can get in touch with Dennis there. Check out his DVDs and his books. And we're going to have you back, Dennis, uh, as soon as we can get you back, because I want to know what's new with Dennis Balthayer, okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for being my guest. We're going to have another episode next week. You stay tuned right here on Conundrums. The following program has been brought to you by Shoulder Shooter at Shouldershooter.com. Get steady, shake-free shots with your large or handheld camcorder with the Shoulder Shooter.